Well, hey there, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Roswell Park's pediatric webinar. I'm Rebecca Vogt, Media Relations Specialist here at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center in Buffalo, New York. We would like to extend a big thank you to everyone who is tuning in with us. COVID-19 has really shaken up uh, a lot over the last few months, and one of the biggest hurdles that we have had to overcome is how to approach the return to school, which has been, you know, in headlines for weeks and weeks and weeks now. In today's topic, we plan to focus on coping with your child's new back to school plan. I'm so happy to be joined by two wonderful individuals. We have Dr. Brandy Aquilino, who is a medical psychologist in the pediatrics department, then also Dr. Barbara Bambach. She is a pediatric hematologist oncologist and clinical director of the pediatric bone marrow transplant program here at Roswell Park. Drs. Aquilino and Bambach, uh, why don't we first share have you guys share a little bit about yourselves and we will start with Dr. Aquilino. Hi, so um, I am the pediatric medical psychologist um, and I work alongside with the medical team um, providing psychological support to all of our pediatric patients and their families. So doing a lot of uh, individual uh, emotional support, family focused support, and also spend a great deal of my time doing work within the community and the schools. Dr. Bambach. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, so as you said, I'm one of the uh, attending physicians here in the Department of Pediatric Hematology Oncology. So I take care of the children that have blood disorders um, and, cancer dis and cancer as well. Um, I focus a little bit more in terms of leukemia and lymphoma patients. And I also am one of our transplant physicians and oversee our pediatric bone marrow transplant program. Great, excellent. Thank you guys both for those introductions. So we should really get down to it. Sending children back to school during a pandemic, it's been really like confusing and frustrating for a lot of parents in general. And when you add in a cancer diagnosis and also treatment into the mix, things likely get very, very complicated between your student needs, you have school district policies and also diagnoses. We know there is really like no like one size fits all answer to address this topic. Doctors Aquilion Bambach, um, we're gonna start by discussing some common questions or concerns that you come across in the clinic. And then we can also answer questions from the audience if we have anything that comes through. And for those of you who are tuning in live, you have the option to submit your questions through the chat feature below, it's a little chat bubble. Uh, make sure you send it to all participants participants. Uh, we're keeping an eye on it and monitoring. Um, there's also an option too, if you don't want to have it um, attached to your name, there's an anonymous choice for you as well, but we'll try to get to as many, as, as many things as we possibly can in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, and uh, I guess we'll kind of really kick it off with some of these pre-submitted that we have going on. So um, either of you feel free to jump in. And also if one of you wants to piggyback off of another one's question, feel free to do that as well. Uh, we'll start off with this first one. So my child has trouble focusing at home. What can I do to help them? So um, I think this is, a, this is a very real issue um, for many, many families. And um, these questions have been coming in already as school just started. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's very important for um, parents to be, parents or caregivers or whomever's home with the child to be very kind to themselves and very patient with this process. Um, virtual learning, remote learning is very different. And depending on the age of your child, there is new challenges. Um, the little ones, often it's, it's a lot harder to keep them engaged. Um, but even for the older ones, I think it's a long, exhausting day for them to be learning um, by screen all day long. So some of the things that we recommend are um, setting up a routine with your child, finding a space um, that, is, that is least distracting. I know everyone's home environment and resources do look different but finding a quiet place where the child um, can have access to their technology and have minimal distractions. Also communicating with your school, communicating with your child's teaching team is huge so that um, you can communicate how your child learns best. You know, it may be the synchronous stuff that it's coming easier for them because it's live learning. It may be the asynchronous where you're able to do it individually with them um, and do some one-on-one -on -one prompting with them. But working with the school, finding out what the expectation is for this remote learning for their individual teaching team, and then also communicating how your child learns best. And it has to be an ongoing process. If things aren't working, you need to bring it to the teacher's attention. And I think there's going to be a lot of um, 
kind of changing plans as they go along and kind of refining what you're doing at home to help your child. Open communication is key for sure. Um, now for the kiddo who maybe misses seeing their friends, I mean, one of the biggest things about, you know, going to school and, you know, interacting is, 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 you know, meeting new people or, you know, seeing the, the friends that you, you haven't seen all summer, that sort of thing. And now that's really has been put to sort of a screeching halt. Um, what can be done to help balance those needs for friendship and social interaction without putting them at risk? Um, I, I think from the um, standpoint of keeping them socially connected, of course, you know, these virtual things that we have set in place, the Zoom calls and the FaceTiming um, and things like that are still strongly encouraged. Um, I know that a lot of parents are coming to us on an individual basis with specific scenarios to see if they're safe or not for their child. Um, I know we still are encouraging small groups and, and people that we are familiar with and kind of know where they've been and what they've been exposed to doing a lot outdoors. Um, but I know, Dr. Bambeck, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that from a safety standpoint. Sure, um, thanks, Brandy. So from the, from the school perspective, in terms of attending school, um, you know, as you've already said, the social interactions that the children get out of school is so important and, and attending school and going to school um, really helps with their overall emotional and psychological well-being. And those also have a big factor in terms of how children deal with going through their treatment. Um, so it, it definitely is a balance that has to be worked out. Um, it's important, I think, to make sure that you're speaking with your doctor. You know, every child's um, illness or, or whatever they're being seen for by us can really be unique to them. And so there may be certain instances that would make us favor remote learning versus school learning. Uh, but if your child is going to go to school, which we really are trying to help facilitate that if it's done in a safe way and if the families are comfortable with that, um, then talking to your child about how they need to behave when they're in school, making sure that they're following really all of the precautions that are in place, the mask wearing, the cleaning of you know, of their hands with sanitizing or, or hand washing very, very frequently, not touching things from other, um, you know, other kids in school using their own supplies, not sharing their phones when they're in school and passing it back and forth amongst their friends. You know, those are all really important things to talk to your child about um, in terms of what they're doing when they're in school. And then when they come home from school, washing their hands again, as soon as they get into the house. Um, although, Again, whether you send your child to school or not um, is, I, I think, a, an individual decision that really has to be made between the parent and your physician. And Brandy and her team have been doing extraordinary work with working with the schools to get the information that we need to know what kinds of safe practices they have put in place that helps us to make our decision and our recommendations for the families. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I think as you guys mentioned before, nothing says, uh, you know, Petri dish than like a shared phone or, you know, if uh, you send off little Johnny to school with a mask and he comes home with a, you know, a friend's mask. So yeah, lots of things to be discussed and talked through for sure. Um, shifting over to some of the, the plans and of course, every district has been different with what they've been implementing. Um, but one question coming in uh, being, my child is following a hybrid model and goes into the classroom. What can I do to ensure that I'm keeping them as safe as possible? Uh, yeah, so this, this goes back to what we were just talking about again in terms of, you know, the child's going to school um, and really making sure that when they're in school that they're wearing their masks, washing their hands, not sharing things, uh, and when they're coming home so that they're not exposing other family members to anything that they may have potentially been exposed to, make sure that they're washing their hands. And, and quite honestly, the mask wearing and the hand washing are really, really key throughout all of this. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of talk about sanitizing and the schools are sanitizing desks and, and those, those things are important as well. But if you're not washing your hands and you're not wearing your masks, none of that is going to make a difference. 
hit the nail right on the head there, yes. <laughs> um, so for some people who are may, may be wondering about this, um, what is a 504 plan? And how does one know if their child might need one and how can they ask to get one? What's sort of all the, you know, the process through all of that? So it's a really important um, question and something for all of our parents who have children in treatment to consider. So um, even pre-COVID, typically when our children are diagnosed with um, cancer and I meet with them and I work with them on this, this, the things that are pertaining to school, one of the things we always advocate for is a medical 504 plan. And I like to think of that as a blueprint for um, the child's school accommodations. So it is something that is developed. Um, I am usually heavily involved in that. Um, and I can kind of help the parent navigate their particular school. Um, it usually is really quite simple in the fact that we let the parent know because of the medical diagnosis and both the physical and the cognitive um, difficulties or deficits their child may you know, have due to their treatment. Um, that what we would like to do is have a diagnostic letter written. So basically I work with the medical team. We get a letter out to the school, which is the documentation piece, letting them know their child is going to be going through treatment. And then we ask for things and it's individual based on the child's treatment plan and the child themselves. But some examples would be something like uh, modified workload. So the child actually has less work to um, have to complete. Um, additional time for assignments. Um, something as simple as irregular attendance, because we know the child, whether it be remote nowadays or if they're going through a hybrid model, that child may not be there for regular attendance. Um, and also um, other things like reinforcement and things with certain parts of learning. Um, so we do really encourage parents. And if anybody um, needs more information about that, they can talk to their care team. And I know that in pediatrics, we're, we're very um, quick to be able to handle that and actually get that, that running quickly with the school. Great, excellent. That's wonderful to hear. Um, kind of flipping back, um, so there's a question of uh, a child that uh, is going into school. So you have one, one sibling that's going to school and then one who is at home who may be in active treatment and schooling virtually. So how does one sort of protect, you know, each other um, when one is doing the one option and one's doing the other, which I'm sure also kind of predates back to COVID because there are a lot of siblings who are in school and, um, you know, other ones who are taking the, you know, learning at home, whether it was some, a tutor was coming in, that sort of thing, but um, open to any of the guidance that you can give on, on that end with handling the siblings in and then virtually. Absolutely. So, so again, the siblings that are going to school, really important that they're maintaining the safety precautions that are in place and, and following all of that. And then when they come home, um, washing their hands. If they have a backpack that they're taking to school, um, if that can be wiped down, that would be you know a good thing to do. And then when they're home, really being careful that they're, <laughs> um, sorry, <laughs> really being careful that they're not Technical difficulty with the light. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, really being uh, careful that they're um, not sharing things. Uh, so, you know, they shouldn't be eating after each other, drinking, for, uh, you know, um, after the same glass. They shouldn't be sharing toothbrushes. They shouldn't be sharing washcloths and towels, um, you know, those, those sorts of things. And then certainly if the child experiences any symptoms whatsoever um, and, and I don't know if we want to talk about that now or, or down the line, but um, at that point, it's really a good idea to try to maintain as much separation as possible, but it, don't go crazy. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to kick your child out of the house and send them, you know, off to go live with somebody else, um, but really trying to, you know, keep them away from each other. Don't have them sit next to each other at the, you know, at the dinner table together, for example. Um, you know, if they're, um, able to not use the same bathroom, um, you know, or not sleep in the same bedroom. Those are things that you can do during a time if, if your one child who is attending school does come down with any kinds of symptoms that have you worried. And actually, uh, Dr. Aquilino, maybe this could also kind of, uh, in a way, pertain to you. I mean, like, what happens to, like, when you have siblings who are really close, you know, they, they usually spend a lot of time together and, you know, and yet, 
you know, they're being told to be, to kind of be separated. I mean, how do you kind of discuss that through with families who, who may be having that issue? Yeah. Um, so I think that um, from the, usually the time of the diagnosis, so even outside of the COVID restrictions, when we, when a, when a sibling becomes ill and it really is the whole family is dealing with that, um, there are a lot of, a lot of emotions that come along with that. There is a lot of issues um, that a sibling faces in watching their brother or sister, um, you know, obviously for obvious things, get more attention or be the focus of the family's um, concern and things like that. So we do try to do a lot of sibling support just from the beginning, talking about what's happened in the family system, talking about the fact that their brother or sister is ill and, it, and it's nobody's fault that this happened. It's something inside the brother or sister's body that stopped working the right way. And so when anybody becomes sick, it's just natural. And I always tell the brothers and sisters, it's no matter who in your family becomes sick, it is natural that a lot of time and attention have to go to that person while we figure out how to start treating their illness and how to start helping them feel better. So we do naturally have these conversations, um, or if we haven't, I encourage families to have these conversations. So adding this layer of, you know, um, now we have to be separated and we have to be more cautious, we really talk about their sibling's immune system and how when we're treating that cancer, um, part of that treatment also is affecting their healthy blood cells and things like that, that help their brothers or sisters fight colds and fight flus and things like that. And so really kind of bouncing off that and talking about right now your brother or sister is going through all this, they don't have all their germ fighters or whatever language we use, whether we've got a little one or a, or a young adult or teenager, but helping them understand that and, and not really wanting them to feel guilt with that but really here are some of the things we can do as a family to help your brother and sister stay as healthy as possible. And letting them know that if their brother or sister does get sick or does catch a germ, it's not their fault. It's part of being a family and part of sharing that space. Um, but I think that it's just something that we have to be kind of aware of and cautious of how we communicate that with siblings so that they don't feel you know, more guilt or more conflict than they're already experiencing. Right, which does kind of lead me to the next uh, element, next question, um, in that, you know, what if a kid is having, you know, a hard time understanding why, you know, school can't resume as normal yet? Because, I mean, on top of, you know, everything else, they're, you know, they, they, they can't physically go back to see their friends or what have you. Um, how, how does one explain this to them. I mean, I'm sure that's everyone from a kindergartner up to, you know, a middle schooler and everything in between. So, so I've been answering a lot of these questions um, with, with uh, both our patients, families, and other people in the community who have been coming to me for some guidance. And the way that I like to um, kind of communicate this to children, again, everything is varying about my language, what I'm using. If you're little or, or you're, you know, if you're a preschooler to a school age to a, to a teenager, but the idea generally is that there's this virus going around and that the virus is, is, you know, germs that can get inside our body and make us sick. And so right now we've all kind of gotten the hand, you know, we've all gotten our mind wrapped around staying six feet apart or wearing a mask, um, washing our hands, um, not being in big crowds. So what I've been helping people understand is school is typically a place where we you know, we don't wash our hands all of the time and we are in crowds and we are not wearing a mask typically. And so right now, in order to help um, our bodies stay safe and to keep the people that we love or the people that are around us safe, we need to be following these rules. And so with school, it is hard to be in a building and follow all of those rules with everybody doing things the way we used to. So we've got to be in school in a way that is safe. And talking about some of the schools have been able to um, make those rules put into play so that their schools are a safe place to come. They can keep children separated. They can keep children wearing a mask. They can keep their numbers low enough. They can do things with school buses. And so those schools have decided that they were able to do that safely. And some schools are still trying to figure that out or they're deciding we can't do that right now. And so in order to keep everybody safe, we need to do this remotely. And so just helping children understand is really about going into places that can follow those rules safely. And that's a lot of work for a school and they have to do it the right way. On top of that too, like you said, it's like the language that you're using too, but it's all, and it's like presenting it in a way that like you're not trying to incite 
panic in a child. I mean, you're really trying to rationalize with them as, as much as you can rationalize with a kindergartner, you know, um, <laughs> about what's going on so that they're not, you know, scared out of their wits, but they also understand that like, this is just not the time and, you know, we'll, we'll get there someday, but right now we all just need to be safe sort of thing. Um, we shift on down a little bit to, and I think this is kind of, uh, Dr. Brambeck, this might be for you. Um, so we're talking about sort of mild symptoms. Like, you know, if, if my kid has a mild symptom that could be anywhere from a mild cold or allergies, uh, should we be taking them immediately to get tested? What's the protocol? So um, the simple answer is yes. <laughs> And the, and the reason is um, we've learned that COVID can really present in so many different ways. Uh, obviously, we worry about the patients that get very, very sick and need to be hospitalized because they're so sick. But we also know that patients can um, come, come down with COVID and just have mild symptoms, whether it be runny noses, whether it be um, with vomiting and diarrhea, um, fevers, uh, and, and then obviously the ones that people hear about in terms of the loss of taste and loss of smell. Um, but even just a, a mild runny nose and a cough can potentially be COVID. And because of the concern about exposing other people, especially if your child is going to school and has the potential to expose all of those people in the school, um, this, the schools really have to take a, a pretty firm stance with this. So if your child is experiencing any symptoms like that and you try to send your child to school, there's a very good chance that they're going to be sent home anyway. Um, so the best thing to do if your child gets sick is, is to call your doctor, um, whether it be us, um, you know, if, if it's the child that we're seeing on active therapy or whether it be the sibling um, and you're calling their primary care physician, but call your doctor. And there is a very good chance that your doctor is gonna tell you you have to come in, we have to see them, we have to get them COVID tested, because if you don't, your other options are going to be your child having to stay out of school for an extended period of time, um, up to two weeks. And um, the, you know, the only other way that many of these schools are allowing children to get back into school if they are sick with any of these symptoms is what the doctors know. And the doctor is probably not gonna write that note Un unless they do COVID testing, um, or at the very least, see the child to see if there's something that they can attribute it to instead of COVID. It does kind of naturally, though, float into sort of the next question, though, and I know you, you kind of mentioned it, but like, are we talking about, you know, if there's a kid in active treatment, there's concern about like, they, they may be sick. Do you want Roswell first? Do you want primary physician first? What, what, where's the, where is the um, kind of hierarchy sure. there? So the, the children that, that we are actively treating, whether it be our oncology patients that are getting chemotherapy or our patients that have had a bone marrow transplant and are still on um, medications to suppress their immune system, or even some of our hematology patients, um, like our patients with sickle cell disease, for example, um, it, it really is best to contact us first. If your child is off therapy, then you can go through your primary care physician at that point. Certainly if your primary care physician has any concerns, they're welcome to give us a call. Or if after talking to your primary care physician, you're um, still somewhat uncomfortable and have additional questions, you're welcome to give us a call as well. And what happens if, you know, a, a school unfortunately has an outbreak where, you know, where, I'm sure, you know, there's going to be a lot of people sort of floundering for, for what to do. And I know the districts will probably put out some advice, but yeah, I wanted to ask you guys about, you know, best course of action here. Right. So I, there certainly are going to be things that are going to be mandated by, you know, Erie County Health Department um, if, if there is a true outbreak and, and what the schools are going to have to do. And, and that's going to become going remotely really for everybody. Um, if for some reason you feel as though your school is having a high incidence and, and a lot of the schools have really been wonderful with communication um, between themselves and, and the parents. Um, and, and certainly, again, that's a, a place where Brandy can be helpful as well if you have any concerns about that. Um, but, you know, if you're concerned that your school seems to be having high incidence, but yet is not making changes in terms of thinking about going remotely, 
give us a call um, because Again, we'll reach out to the school. We'll try to get additional information to find out what's going on. Or maybe that would be a time where, depending upon what, what your child's particular illness is and where they are in their treatment, we may say, well, you know what? Maybe now is a time that at least your child should back out at, at this point. And we can help to facilitate that as well. So throughout all of this, you know, we've really, we've, we've run the gamut of, um, you know, talking about, you know, the way that we approach kids and, you know, how they should handle things, whether they are in school or out of school. Um, but, you know, with anything, um, I'm sure it can get to the kids, you know, emotionally and physically. Is there a way to tell if, you know, a kid is being stressed or under a lot of stress, especially with this. I mean, and now on top of it, you're, you have added schoolwork that they have to do and they're not seeing their friends and that sort of thing. Um, so how can you tell if a kid is really stressed out and, and what can be done to help? I think um, this is gonna look different again, depending on um, your child's personality, how they typically function and also their age and their kind of stage where they are. Um, but one of the things I'm, I'm thinking is really important is, again, I can't stress enough, keeping the line of communication open with your child. However your child um, does communicate or does not communicate, kind of being a little bit more on top of that, you should always be on top of it, but um, looking for things like behavioral changes in children, whether that be eating or sleeping changes. Um, some of this is tricky for our families that are um, on treatment because their children's routines and their children's um, appetites and their children's sleep habits and moods um, from medications or just from the adjustment to being, to being diagnosed, a lot of those behavioral changes come along with diagnosis. So being aware that, you know, we're going we're gonna to let the team know, we're going to let the psychosocial support team know and let our, our um, physicians know when we see these changes so we can help sort through some of that. But, you know, if you notice that your child is sleeping more, sleeping less, eating less, eating more, um, you know, um, if you see that your child is agitated more or, um, you know, crying more, um, withdrawing more, um, if you notice that they're not connecting with friends, you know, if you have a, a teenage boy and he's used to living on his headset and doing video games and all of a sudden that's not bringing him joy anymore, he's not connecting like that, you just see more sleeping or you see more of a lot of times with um, children, we don't recognize it, but depression isn't always a passive thing. It comes out in agitation and anger outbursts. So if we're noticing changes in how our child is typically behaving, um, you know, I think it's really important to talk to your care team and let us help sort through some of those things with you to see what we can do. Because the earlier we can intervene to help, um, the easier it'll be on everybody and the, and the better we can help the child so that they don't have to struggle longer. Thank you for that. Um, we actually have a couple of questions that have come into our chat. Um, and one of the first being that, so children who are off treatment, are they at any greater risk of contracting COVID compared to a child who has never had a cancer diagnosis? Generally speaking, no, they would not be. Um, although that is that answer is tempered a little bit by depending how recently off therapy they are. If it's somebody who just finished therapy a week ago, yes, they probably are at a little bit greater risk. If they've been off therapy for six months, then no, the answer would be no. They would be just as much at risk as the general population. Okay, and then um, of course the the other thing that's sort of hanging over our heads is um, the fact that we're about to head barrel straight first into flu season. I'm um, a question about flu shots. Um, a good time. Oh, your lights went off again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's okay. All good. So, question about flu shots. Um, and then when is a good time for those on active treatment to get their shot? I will add to the general public who are tuning in right now. We did have a COVID and flu webinar uh, yesterday. That would be two. Tuesday um, that will be available on YouTube to view hopefully very shortly. Um, so there's a lot of great questions that were answered in that. Dr. Mullen from our staff did answer those, but I will also have Dr. Van Back address them if she is, is open to do so. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we've always encouraged flu shots every year, but I think even this year, it's so much more critical. Um, again, a lot of the symptoms of flu can be overlapping with COVID. So if anybody were to come down with symptoms, you wouldn't necessarily know that it was flu. So if you can prevent yourself from getting those symptoms um, from flu and thinking that it's COVID, 
of the concerns that would be around that, that's a good idea. But we also know that sometimes um, patients will actually be co-infected with both infections as well, COVID and the flu. Uh, so uh, really decreasing um, as much as possible your chances of getting the flu, and that includes getting the flu vaccine. So we are currently giving flu vaccine to our pediatric patients that we're seeing in clinic. So um, the children that are in active therapy or even the children that are coming to our clinic for follow-up visits at this point in time, we're ready and able and willing and wanting to give you your flu vaccines right now. Um, there are really um, it are not a lot of contraindications to getting the flu vaccine. So even if your child is on active therapy, we're still giving it. Even if their blood counts are low, we're still giving it. Um, and then the other important thing is besides vaccinating the patient or the child that we're seeing, the rest of the family really needs to be vaccinated as well against the flu um, because otherwise they can just bring the flu into the household as well. Um, so many of the pediatricians in the community have, have the flu shots and are ready to be able to give them to the siblings. Um, the parents can go to their primary care physicians and then also a lot of the local pharmacies um, you know, have the flu shots and are, and are really starting to give them out also. So, so really I would say Anytime now, just go and go ahead and get them. Don't wait. Sound advice. <laughs> um, before we uh, wrap up here today, I do want to just have a final open the floor to both of you if you would like to say some, you know, closing round, uh, closing statements for us and some some takeaways that uh, you know parents and um, you know if there's any pediatric patients who are tuning in uh, should should have as we continue on and through the rest of the school year. Um, Dr. Aquilino, if you want to start. I just want to um, reassure everybody that um, we are here, we are accessible, um, our psychosocial team, our medical team, um, and we are, you know, able to really help you navigate any parts of this pandemic, um, all the while knowing that um, first and foremost, you have your child going through the cancer treatment. So please don't hesitate to reach out, even if you're not sure if you need help, sometimes just talking things through. Um, and sorting things out um, can be very helpful. So please just let us know if there's anything that uh, we can do for you. I, I would just like to second that, obviously, um, and, and really put a plug in for Brandy and, and her team that she works with, with our social worker and our other psychologists and our child life people. Um, they're tremendous. And, um, and we are all here to really work together as a team and not just for your child, but for the whole family as well. So if you are having problems, if, you're, um, if the child's siblings are having problems, please reach out to us um, so that we can help you. And the, the big thing about, you know, the, the big take home in terms of safety as I, I think harp down throughout all of this is follow the precautions, wear them and do the hand washing. Um, those are just so vitally important. Um, and the flu shot. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thank you both for taking time out of your day to join us today for this webinar. Um, great information. And uh, we hope that anyone who didn't have the chance to tune in, um, you guys will have, uh, you know, you'll have the opportunity to, we're going to get it out there. Um, so um, if any of your questions, they weren't answered, or if you have any uh, specific concerns, we do ask you to reach out to your child's oncologist or psychologist. And like I just said, the recording of this webinar, it isn't just going to poof and disappear out of everywhere. It's going to be emailed to anyone who signed up ahead of time. And then we're all also going to be posting it to our page for on-demand viewing and uh, you can visit roswellpark.org slash pediatric webinar to uh, both view it or also share it if there's someone today that you know like I said missed it give them a little prod say hey here's the link take a look at it and uh, hopefully it will assuage any fears or concerns that um, parents students would have you ha um, may have as we uh, continue to navigate uh, what is considered a slightly challenging uh, school year. So that all being said, everyone, uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you again for tuning in and have a great rest of your week. Bye everyone. Thank you.